Um, okay. So, thank you all for coming. The definition of geometric recursion part two, or 2.0. Um, so, what we're going to try and do is give a proper definition for the setting of this geometric recursion to take place. Um, so we probably won't get to actually proving it, so we'll see that in the next talk, but we'll sort of set up what we mean by target theory and what kind of initial data we want to put in to this target theory to actually make sense out of this construction. So I'll just set up some of the sort of notation and describe some of the categories of surfaces that we're interested in. Um, so a boarded surface for us is going to be Smooth, oriented, compact, two manifold, um, with an orientation on the ground sheet. Um, so this is kind of slightly more information, so this orientation can either be the orientation induced um, from the surface or it can be opposite that. And so this is kind of important for us to remember. Uh, and so sort of some notation that we're going to use for any connected component of our surface um, will denote sigma of A as the corresponding connected component. Uh, and similarly, if we have an element of the boundary, a uh, connected component to the boundary, um, we'll do the same. So we'll denote a little del B of sigma as the B boundary component corresponding to this connected component. Um, and so then the two kinds of boundary components we have, we'll sort of label those sets as well. So if we have um, a set of boundary components that have opposite orientation um, to the one induced from the surface, we'll denote by um, del minus of sigma. Um, I'll also I'll just go in sigma. Um, and so this is the set of boundary components um, with the opposite orientation. And then I'll call these components with the same orientation or um, del plus of sigma or maybe del out of sigma and I'll explain why I like these in a second and so this is the set of bound components with the same orientation as the one induced from the surface okay. um, and so we're going to be interested not in all of these surfaces, but surfaces that we're going to call stable, and so that's sort of surfaces with enough topology, maybe, or enough topology on their connected components. So, sigma is stable if uh, it's empty, or if for every connected component of sigma, um, the Euler characteristic of the connected component is less than zero. So what does this mean? Basically, we're not going to have any connected components that are 
either once or twice punched sphere, or a sphere, or a torus. So these services are going to be stable if they don't have any connected components of the place. Okay, great. So now we can define this category board. And so this is just going to be a groupoid. Um, it's going to remember sort of the automorphisms of these surfaces. Um, so board is a category such that the objects of board are uh, not all border surfaces, but stable. Uh, and the morphisms between any two of these stable bordered surfaces is a set of isotopic classes of diffeomorphisms. So yeah, this is a groupoid, all the homomorphisms are invertible. Um, and so we're kind of interested in representations of this, of categories like this into vector spaces. And then we're going to get representations of these mapping class groups. Um, and so here we're going to um, slightly change this for our construction and consider a subcategory. Board one, and so this is the full subcategory um, that has only that has only one incoming boundary component for each connected component of our service. So. We can say it's the full subcategory board such that the canonical map from the incoming boundaries of sigma. So okay, what am I saying here? Such that sigma is an element of this category if um, the canonical map sending a connected component of the inner boundary to a connected component of the surface is an isomorphism or a bijection. Okay. So here, um, maybe I'll just quickly draw a picture. So, kind of things we're interested in. So we could take this. So this is an element of our category board, but it's not an element of this board one category because here we've got two incoming boundaries that go to the same connected component. Um, but you could have something like this, for example. And this would be an element of this board one because each connected component here only has one component there. Oh, and the convention is left is in one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, so I should mention. So this, so here, the way that I'm drawing is I'm kind of imagining that the, this would correspond to. L plus sigma or yeah, so sorry, that could be the opposite of other things, but I sort of imagine left to right. <laughs> um, the, the subscript one is just because you want one uh, in for each. Yeah, exactly. 
And so this is important because this is how we're going to, when we construct um, these sums, we're sort of, we're only, we're sort of going to use this framework similar to topological recursion, where we've kind of only got ever one sort of incoming boundary and we sort of glue together along a pair of planes. Um, okay. So, so why, like, this category is, the, the categorical structure is sort of remembering the automorphisms of these things and potentially if we have two surfaces that are the same but look different, you know, we sort of remember the isomorphisms between them, but there's not sort of um, a lot of sort of categorical structure that we're using. Um, Could you clarify that simple something in your maps? Yeah. You want to send the negative boundary to the positive boundary? Yes, the sorry, yes, boundary. definitely. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so these stick morphisms, yeah, sorry, this is actually quite important. So preserving the orientation of the surfaces, preserving the orientation of and boundaries. Yeah. So potentially a remark um, is that in board one um, uh, the incoming boundaries. So if we have a connected surface then um, this incoming boundary is preserved. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, and so then um, we just sort of have some notation for these automorphism groups, which are just the mapping class groups of our surface. So the automorphisms in this boardism category not board is carried, it's board category. Okay. Um, we sort of denote by this gamma, and then we're, there's an interesting subgroup here that um, is going to fix these boundary components piecewise. So here, a priori, um, we could consider diffeomorphisms that sort of swap these boundary components, but when I label this little del up here, this is sort of describing the set of these automorphisms such that the induced map um, from the boundary of sigma, the connected components of the boundary of sigma. to the next point of the boundary sigma is equal to the identity. Okay. Um, and so I already mentioned connected things, so we say that sigma is connected if the surface is. Okay. Sorry, one more clarification. Yep. When you think the isotopies in the definition, you fix the boundary or? Mm -hmm. no, so you, or no, no, so you can, I mean, so what I was saying here is a priori you can sort of send one boundary component to another boundary component in this definition. Yeah. Like, oh, but you're saying in these. What's in these other And I see, yeah, okay, yeah, I see. Um, no, so I think it's fine. I think the isotopies that I want are you're allowed to sort of yeah, twist the boundary around. I think it's important. So, um, yeah, you can write some sort of short exact sequence of these things and basically you're going to get, um, maybe I'll write this down to clarify, uh, but I'll just potentially introduce some notation. But yeah, so you should be able to sort of twist these boundary components. Mm -hmm. And when you do cutting, um, that's important, like these twists along Sort of the boundary components and then being able to isotope them, that's sort of going to be sent to zero when you sort of cut these things. But anyway, so it's pretty many but maybe I'll describe it once I talk about cutting. 
that all answer the question better. So we're interested in here we don't have like a cobordism category, so we sort of don't have an idea of cutting surfaces and kind of gluing them together to get bigger categories. We've just sort of got this board and these um, map and class group elements. So where we need to sort of talk about how to cut things in more detail. So um, we can define a multi-curve as a multi-curve in sigma. As an embedding, of a compact one manifold in sigma. Um, do I want isotopic class? No, I'm going to say that. Oh, I'm going to be class, yeah. Multi-curve is So here the picture is clear, um, we're just talking about something like this. Um, and so this is just going to be embedding of some number of circles into your uh, surface. Um, it's not the whole standard, right? You will allow null entropy components. Fun. You will allow null entropy components? Uh, yes, at the moment. And you allow also homotopy components? Right? Two curves that are the same? Yes, at the moment. So I'm going to then, so this isn't exactly what I want to cut along. I'm going to describe exactly what I want to cut along in a second. So you can see potentially where the issue is you had two homotopic curves, you're going to get something like a cylinder cropping up. So I'm going to define something called a stable multi-curve, which is sort of going to potentially fix those issues. Um, okay, so I call this set of multi curves on sigma. And if I want these multi curves to not be homotopic to the boundary, I'll consider this set, so you can kind of think of interior multi curves. With this surf notation, zero notation. Um, yeah, so the set so yeah, set of multi curves with no component uh, home topic to the boundary. So Just to note with a hat, the connected multi curves. So these are just simple closed curves. And if these are simple closed curves with um, no component of that aren't on the topic to the boundary. Okay. Um, so given a multi curve, Sorry, maybe no, I want this, but so given a multi curve, I can cut along this and I'm going to get a well defined um, element of this board up to, up to some isomorphism, which is why we're sort of interested in keeping track of these things. So potentially, my choice of representative here is going to give me different choices of actual sigma, but they're going to be isomorphic in a canonical way, coming from the homotopy. So, 
for a multi-curve, I'm going to denote this as the surface. Obtain sigma by cutting along gamma. Okay. So sorry, maybe you just said that you have to choose a representative. Uh, yes, exactly. So service cutting along gamma. So yeah, maybe I'll write it down. So mark. <clears throat> on representative of gamma, um, but we get canonical isomorphisms between the two surfaces using that. Okay. Yeah, this is why it's nice to sort of have these categories because they take care of these kind of things, they remember these kind of choices we're making in some sense. Um, okay. Same. Okay, yeah, so this sort of um, so this is short exact sequence that I was kind of talking about before should be something like this where this is um, generated by the den twists along the multi-curve. So you get something that sort of looks like this. Okay, so here I didn't quite find the notation, but this is, should be the subgroup of the Mackenpass group that preserves the free image of each of these curves under um, the, under like the length of the cutting. So you should have something like this. So when, when we sort of cut along sigma, we sort of lose these dang twists along there, which I think should sort of make clearer potentially what this um, is up. Okay, so now this is kind of all the notation that I sort of need. Is there is that sort of roughly clear? So the main thing is we just want to oh I didn't actually define one thing. So I, meant, I think I said it in words at some stage, but so maybe after here, this is inside the board. Um, but I'll call an element of this stable if um, after I cut, I get a stable surface. Okay, and so actually potentially I need to say a little bit more. Um, so here this is kind of a notation and now we're interested in a very particular sort of class of cutting up our surfaces. We're interested in sort of cutting out pairs of pants and the boundary. This is how the geometric recursion is going to be defined. We're going to consider all possible ways of getting our surface from pairs of pants and we're going to sum over all these possible ways and hopefully we'll see all of the structure today that we need um, in order for this infinite sum to be well defined and this is sort of the main content of these axioms. Um, so, so in the paper it's referred to as excising a pair of pants. Okay. So, I'm interested in a pair of pants, so take a representative of a pair of pants in forward line. Um, so I'm thinking of something like this. But this P 
I sort of want to endow with a little bit more structure. So I kind of I want so I've got one incoming boundary, so because we're in this board run. Uh, but then I want to have labels for these two boundaries. So P is an element of board with an order on the outgoing boundaries. So this is important because if I cut out a pair of pants and I had some picture like this, I'm going to need to determine, if I want to get an element of board, I need to determine which um, boundary components are the incoming and which are going to be the outcoming. So this depends, I'm going to have to use this sort of order to make this choice at some stage. Okay, so, given, given an element of board one, we have three, there are three cases um, of sort of the topology we can get by cutting out a pair of pants. Or excising a pair of pants. So, in the first case, um, we could get something like this. That's one number of outgoing boundary components here. Um, so, basically, what this saying, we have a connected. Um, surface and the pair of pants um, isn't touching one of the outgoing boundary components. And so here, this is where we need, this is actually the main point that we need to have this ordering because for one of these, this looks, like the way I've drawn it, it looks like it's not an element of board one. And so I'm going to, by using this ordering, I'm going to say that this is the in boundary or the minus boundary and this is the out boundary. Out boundary. So then this picture, this should look more like this. Okay. In your head. Okay, and so then this symmetry is actually reflected in the geometric recursion as a factor of a half at some point, which is taking basically care of these two cases, because these should sort of be we want them to kind of look like the same thing, but a priori they're different. So then just take it into account. So the other two cases we kind of don't need this ordering. Um, we sort of have canonical ways of getting these boundaries. And then in the geometric recursion formula, this is yeah, this is these sort of cases. Give, basically we don't see this half. Or I guess we do see the half sort of in this next case. Um, but sort of for a different reason. So here, so here this one dash is again we're going to get a connected surface. Um, but now the pair of pants not only borders the incoming boundary, it borders one of the outgoing boundaries. Uh, and so this is going to have genus G and then minus one boundary components. Um, if our sigma goes, um, okay. And so here we have this obvious incoming boundary. So this is fine. And then in this last case, we have a disconnected surface when we cut along these. And here we get some other surfaces with genus G, one, and N one, two, N two. 
and there's the obvious the relation between these like G1 and G2, summing out to be G and whatnot. Um, and so here, so this is sorry, where this other factor of two is going to come in because there's sort of two ways that we could sort of glue them up. But here we have the already obvious choice of incoming down the range of these connected components. And so I hope I said any word, but I'm sort of assuming, I, sh I should have hopefully said it, but sigma was connected in this, um, in this cutting operation. And so these are the only possible cases. And in fact, these possible cases um, represent orbits um, of this set under mapping class group. So let's call this set something so I can actually say what the mapping class group is acting on. So for a connected component of this board one, I'm going to say that this P sigma is the set of homotopy classes um, of embeddings of this pair of pants in sigma. If I want to be more specific about what class of these we have, I can use this superscript D to represent the F representing these embeddings of pairs of pants. Um, and so here I'm sort of considering this as an embedding as an object in board one. So I mean this is an amorphism in board one per se, but so here. Um, where it is sort of described as above. So embeddings of the pair, um, this pair of pants that have incoming boundary, the same as the surface. Um, okay, and so then we're interested in these pairs of pants bounding the first um, boundary things such that if I consider the boundary of this pair of pants embedded in the surface, and I intersect this with the outgoing boundaries of sigma, this equals d. And so this is for some d an element of Yeah, and sorry, yes, and in the empty set. So this could, so then in that case, if we have D union the empty set, then we're going to be exactly in this case over here. Or here. Um, okay, and so as I mentioned, the so mapping class group acts on these embeddings. Um, and so we're sort of interested in summing over all these possible embeddings because then when this, if this sum is well defined and absolutely convergent, I just had it before, what am I doing? Um, then the action of the mapping class group on the sum should just commute the terms and then if this sum is absolutely convergent then we can sort of see obviously that this is going to be invariant, whatever this sum is, under the action of the mapping class group. So, I'm going to say, the mapping class group acts on this set with a finite number of orbits. And above. As you can see that these are the all you're not going to be able to get from one of these cases to another sort of by considering the geometric content of the pairs of pants and what we get left after we cut it out. Um, and to see that we can get all of these things by the action, you kind of just have to potentially look at a different pair of pants that give you the same picture, and then you sort of have these two pictures that are equivalent and so that's sort of giving you an element of mapping class group that relates to. Um, 
and then in the slide more specific, sorry, I just want to check the notation. Hmm. So, say? Okay, so, okay, I think I've written it down. Um, but we can also consider this mapping class group that preserves the boundary acting on this set. And this, again, has finite orbits. It's finite number of orbits. Um, but we're still going to, we're going to have more. So for example, if we fix the boundary and we act on this, then um, we're not going to be able to get, um, say, all of those cases in I1. We're going to be stuck to having one of these boundary components. So, for example, an orbit would be this P sigma D for some element of this connected component. Okay, but the fact that we have a finite number of audit, um, orbits is good because in the end, we're sort of going to sum over all the elements in this orbit, and that's the part that's a bit unclear if that's going to be well defined. And so this is where our axioms are going to come in, and then we get sum over these orbits in the end. But that's just a finite sum, and so everything's good. Okay, cool. Does this all make sense? Yeah, great. So now I'm going to sort of describe a little bit this um, example of type more space or continuous functions on type more space, and try and motivate some of the structures that we'll see in these axioms. So, so I'm going to be a little vague, um, but this is just more to give sort of an overview of potentially why um, the axioms that I'm going to describe, which are quite abstract, where they're potentially coming from. Okay, so firstly we have um, an assignment given an element of board one. We can associate to it the continuous functions on its Blackmore space. And so this is the topological vector space, um, which is fresh A. And we can write this as a natural projective limit using the sort of geometric structures coming from Blackmore space. So in particular, um, or an inverse limit, sorry. Um, so it's the limit of a bunch of spaces so basically we're going to look at continuous functions on some subset of type one states and then we're going to say that Continuous functions on the whole thing are a projective limit or an inverse limit of these continuous functions. So So we're looking at an inverse limit of these spaces where these spaces are thrown across by this epsilon. So I'll describe what this is exactly. So this is a subset of Tychmore space. such that we have some bounds on the systole and the lengths of the boundaries. So the conditions are, so it's an element of time space such that the systole is bounded above by epsilon. The systole is the length of the shortest geodesic in the surface corresponding to this element of time space, we we'll consider its hyperbolic structure. Um, and all boundaries The length of this boundary component, which I'll just turn out like this, is also down by by sigma. Ah, oh, sorry, not sigma, it's long. <laughs> so if, yeah, I'll try and make clear the difference between my sigma and it's long bit. Um, okay, great. So we have this association, and this has some kind of nice structure as an inverse limit of some vector spaces. Okay, and so, is that, is that high enough? Um, 
So these spaces have, again, more structure that we're interested in. So each of these vector spaces, the continuous functions on this subset of Tychmon space, is um, fresh A space, so it can be described as, or well, its topology can be described as a separating family of semi-norms. Um, and so this structure is actually important for us, um, because this is what we're going to emulate later. So this, um, so the topology on this space. So it's described by um, the separating family of semi norms. So given sort of in the natural way, we have just some kind of manifold, um, and then we take the, the sub norm on compact sets, and then we sort of index over this compact set. So here, for k. Space, we define the semi norm associated to that as just sub of. And so this induces the topology. So here, what's important to remember is we have this set epsilon of real numbers indexing some vector spaces, and the vector space in the end that we're interested in is an inverse limit of those vector spaces, and for each epsilon, we also have another indexing set that describes the topology on that topological vector space. Um, and so these indexing sets are going to come up in our definition later. Okay, so this is sort of the first structure. Um, and you can see that this is sort of functorial in the ways that we want. Like we have an isomorphism between two vector spaces, and we should get an isomorphism on the right-hand side of all of these things, induced by that. Um, but yeah, so we have more structure than just this. We can sort of, we can define in a way that is not ridiculously canonical, but in a reasonably canonical way, um, a gluing where we have we have a continuous function on a pair of pants, and then we have a continuous function on a surface where we've cut out a pair of pants. We can glue this together. The continuous function on the like more space at the full surface. And so this is described by some equation. I'm not going to describe all the things here. But so if the gluing is sort of done along some multi curve gamma, we take in two functions, and then we link these two functions to the sort of disjoint union, or the type more space of the disjoint union between these two things, and then we sort of integrate over a particular fiber of the lift of that disjoint union over here. Um, so we end up with something that looks kind of like this. Integrating over some fiber of some induced map of these two things. Okay, so this isn't fully really clear right now, so that should be mm -hmm. But yeah, so hopefully next week we'll see exactly all of these descriptions of these objects in time and space in full detail. Um, but so we have this kind of gluing, which is sort of the most important, and we also have this disjoint union, which I've kind of already implicitly described. So if we have continuous function on the more space of two surfaces, then disjoint, we can construct a continuous function on the more space of the disjoint union. So this is sort of important aspects of um, potentially the pre-target theory that we're going to define. Um, but 
for the full target theory that we're going to need to find the describe the geometric recursion, we also need um, to talk about lengths. And so in the fact that we're in this setting of Python space, we can sort of talk about length functions uh, in a natural way. And so these length functions are going to be indexed by these two subsets. Um, so here, this epsilon is some real number, and then each epsilon, we have these compact subsets of this Tychmore space, or this subset of Tychmore space, indexed by epsilon. Um, and so we can, and these length functions are important um, in the structure of the geometric recursion. So another structure that we have is for any multi curve, maybe let's just say for any simple closed curve. So called length functions. So this is that's an epsilon. So we consider the length of this curve in all of the um, points in type normal space associated with this compact subset. Um, and this compact subset is living in a subset of type normal space that is determined by this epsilon. So this is where all of this comes in. Um, okay, and the fact that we're bound with cis goals means that this length is non zero. Um, and so this is important because we're sort of going to want to, in our sum, sort of split the sum up into certain parts that we want to show a conversion. And so there's results in Tychmall space by people like Mizutani counting the number of GD6 of a certain length. And so here, um, we also have that the number of these curves um, with Length. We have some kind of polynomial behavior of this. Okay, so what's important here is that we have this big, like, doubly indexed family of semi norms, and for a fixed choice of the index, we just get some constant. With respect to that index, it depends on the epsilon, on the topology of the surface, and then we just have some polynomial growth in the L. Um, and so then we also have properties on, I guess, the number of, how I would say this, so we also have properties on the number of pairs of pants that we can embed on with certain boundary-like conditions. So, um, so there exists at most some QI number of pairs of pants embedded such that we have something like this. For example, if the pair of pants bounds two internal curves, so this is the unique uh, inboundary. Um, and so we have properties like this. So most, so there's some finite number of these where this inequality is true. So most of our pairs of pants are going to look something like some small length without V1, and then we have some kind of big lengths here. So when this feature isn't true, there's only finitely many of these. So infinitely many, this is the, infinitely many times, this is the kind of feature that we have. Um, and there's another condition for that. Um, and then we can also describe explicitly in this case um, how the Sloan function is behaved under the, what's it called? 
under these norms. And so we have bounds for how that works. And so we understand all of these things in the stack on space picture. And we can use that to prove that these sums, all of these facts are going to be used to prove that the sums that we want to find are going to converge in these semi norms. Okay, so this is kind of, these are the kind of structures we want to emulate with the list of axioms that I'm going to give. Um, and so we can see it's kind of complex, but hopefully we just want to think back to this continuous functions on type normal space and how they interact with some kind of forming, um, these length functions, and sort of how the pairs of pants interact with these length functions. And these are the structures that we're sort of generalizing with these axioms. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about what these target theories are and admissible data is. So first, um, so this is maybe section two. Okay, so a definition, we're going to um, denote the category of power score. So, so let V denote the category of power score uh, complete locally convex. Topological vector spaces and over C or R. Um, and so all of the vector spaces here, the topology is going to be realized by some infinite separating family of seminorms, um, or some separating family of seminorms. So this is sort of these spaces are going to live in this category, and this also admits category admits inverse limits, so we can kind of do the construction to get back continuous functions on the full type normal space in this category. Um, and so we're not just interested in this continuous functions on type normal space. At the end, we're interested in how we get them via this sort of inverse limit. So the category that we're going to uh, represent our bordisms into is actually going to be Category that I'm going to call Pro V. Um, so, um, such that, so this is going to be the category of uh, inverse limits of V, objective limits of V. So, this is going to be sets of a lot of information. So VI, and this is sort of the elements in the limit of this V at the end. Um, and each of these objects has a separating family of semi norms indexed. By some indexing set. So here AI, I remember, was the compact subset of so this subspace of type one space. Okay. Um, such that V is this limit. VI. And so here what we're getting is we get restriction maps from V to each of these things. So we get, and let's denote it by I. A restriction of an element in this set to one of these, and so we can kind of think of elements in here as being described by elements on these spaces that agree under these sort of canonical maps that we get these restriction maps. And so here, it's just restricting to the, sub the, the domain of the continuous function to the subspace as we vary um, epsilon. Okay. So. Um, I need to introduce some notation before I describe exactly the morphisms I want. But basically, I want the morphisms to be as you'd expect to preserve all this vector space structure in the topology, but I also want the morphisms to uh, preserve the sort of bounded elements in this set. So I'll describe what that means. Can you just say, for being what's in the objects, 
the last element, small b. So it's trying to be. So this day is the limit of these counts, this projective limit. And where does the your seminar? Where the seminars send. So. Seminar on which? So this is on i. So it's a family. So for each i, I get some vector space. And then I have a family of uh, separating seminorms on that space that describes the structure. So here. Oh, ah. In the previous example, I should be epsilon. And for each epsilon, you have a topological vector space with a family of seminorms indexed by Alpha, there is kappa, the K is the, the set of uh, compact sets. Yeah, exactly. And so if you get each compact set, you get one of these things. Okay. Yeah. So I haven't described morphisms yet. Because, as I said, I need to use some extra structure that I want them to preserve, or I need to describe some extra structure that I want them to Okay. Um, so I'm going to define these functions. So for each vector space in the limit of this vector space V. Um, I want to define a function from this space to this R plus or you know, positive real numbers and infinity. So potentially I have, potentially this sends things to infinity, but that's fine. Um, to be equal to the supremum over all these compact, or sorry, the supremum over this indexing set of this family of semi Of these semi-norms. Okay. And so yeah, as I said, priori this isn't finite. And so then I consider the subspace of the limit V with this V flat. And flat is going to represent bounded, I guess. But so this is the elements of this limit such that all I um, The norm of this element is bounded. And so here, this isn't necessarily a closed um, subspace, but we just have some subspace to be open. Um, and yet here, this is just meaning it takes this restriction map that I get from V uh, is mapped by, I guess, this, where did I use it? It said this I. V mapping to VI. So here maybe you want to put an I around or something. But this isn't too much interesting. Okay. So these are these bounded elements, and basically I want my morphisms now in this category to preserve these bounded elements. Okay, so So I want this to be the set. Maybe I'll just flesh out the details. So this is going to take restrictions or elements of each of these restrictions of the vector space to um, elements of the restrictions of sorry, this vector space, the elements of the restrictions of this vector space. But I need to somehow remember the order of these i's. Um, and so it's going to be a set of maps like this, and an order preserving map such that So H basically just takes one in, like takes my indices here and sends them to things over here so I can compare things. Um, there's this order preserving. And then each of these 
Um, and then for whenever whenever basically J is more restricted than I, or J is further along the restriction of um, the element of B than I, we consider this map. But we have a map for a morphism like this, um, such that the induced map on the full spaces um, sends the bounded elements of this into a subset of the bounded elements of that. So, as I said, these morphisms um, should just be mapped between these vector spaces, which are basically some index family of maps between each of these restricted vector spaces, and we want them to preserve these bounded elements. Okay, so quick example. is you can just take um, V to equal K um, we can take the index to just be point and then the indexing set of the separating family of semi-norms for that and also just point um, where the norm is just the normal norm absolutely So finite vector spaces and all these will fall into this category, but this is in particular important for us because this is going to be where we want to represent the empty um, boardism or the empty uh, boarded surface. So, um, In this type of space, we had these gluing maps, which we can think of as sort of um, sometimes bilinear um, homomorphism between these two things. And so, because we're dealing with these infinite dimensional vector spaces, we don't necessarily want to take tensor products because that's we need to potentially talk about completions of certain things if we want to stay in a complete space. Um, so we're going to instead talk of, use the structure of, or define what we mean by a bilinear morphism. And so if we're careful about this, we can actually define this Pro-V as a so-called multilinear category, or multi-category, sorry. Um, so we can make this Pro-V a multi-category, which basically is just a category where you can have um, not just morphisms with a single um, source, but with multiple sources. Um, so we can make this multi-category uh, multi by defining a bilinear morphism. So And so here I'm sort of squishing all of that notation of the um, projective limit uh, into just the vector space at the end, but implicitly I've sort of got these things floating around. I've kind of already done that down here when I used the morphism um, between the two. But so here we want some morphism like this, and what should it do? It should just effectively be a linear map between all of these things. We need some kind of order preserving. Um, map to make sense of how to compare what well, which vector spaces we can compare and then we want to preserve the bounded elements so it's kind of the obvious thing but so let's just write down well the obvious thing if we want to describe if we want to preserve these bounded elements so sorry for here maybe i should say uh, is um, so it's a set, it's a set of uh, maps that I'll describe and H 
where H maps the two indexing sets for these inverse objective limits. This third, third set. Um, and so here we give these two indexing sets the lexicographic order. Um, and for for H of I J, what did I do before? I did the same thing. H I J greater than K. Then I want to have one of these morphisms. Uh, such that the morphism induced on full vector spaces yeah. so if I take the bounded elements or cut in product of the bounded elements then this just leaves in the bounded elements so this we can extend the uh, this bilinear morphism to sort of higher things, but this is all we need because we just need to be able to glue and to be able to um, take this joint union. And then, if we want to do more things, we just take that multiple bilinear morphisms composed. Okay, so, and as we've seen with this sort of discussion about Tacknoller space, this category, or as I've kind of said, as I've been describing this category, this um, category describes lots of geometric objects on um, spaces. So, yeah, for example, continuous functions live in this kind of category, um, and other things like differential forms and whatnot. But we could potentially we could potentially take a different category for this, um, for potentially for our target theory um, to live in, but. This, I guess, is one example of something that captures all the structures of the type more space, but potentially there'd be variants. But this is fine. So now that we've got the idea of this category, um, we can define exactly what I was saying a target theory, or not quite a target theory, a pre target theory. Okay. So, free target theory, and valued, I guess, in this category. Essentially, this could be generalized if you need it for examples. Um, so, this is a functor from this Bordism, Board 1 category. So here we're kind of getting for each surface we get a vector space with a representation of the mapping class group on that vector space is the rough idea. Um, and here we're not restricted to finite dimensional vector spaces or taking these sort of we want them to be topological so we can do infinite sums but we're sort of extending um, to, this, to these infinite dimensional representations which is nice for us. Um, so a pre-target theory is a functor like this with or such that we have some axioms, so I'll call this vacuum. Um, so this is the mentality of T. So if we take the empty surface uh, in board one, then we want this, we want the vector space associated to that to just be the field. Okay. Um, so then the union. So we want not only this functor, we want some additional morphisms um, between the images of these elements. So we want um, a union morphism. Such that if we take an element of this product, this gives us an element of the disjoint medium. 
So that space is okay to use my union, sorry. Um, and we also want, so and this, we want this to be compatible with um, like associativity, um, commutivity of these Cartesian products and disjoint union which should all respect these structures. Um, and type of space we also have this gluing, and so we want to have gluing morphism. In board one, you're learning one and maybe the other one is two, because it's just one and it's two, right? Yes, but each connected component will still have only one. Ah, yes, you only care about it. Yeah, only connected components, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we have this union, and we also want um, some kind of gluing or excision, I guess they call it in the paper. Um, okay, so we want, so we have this functor with this union morphism, and then the next structure is this excision morphism, um, or the gluing morphism. So, for a pair of hands, we want to be able to basically take elements of these vector spaces and glue them together to get an element on the space we get. So if we take these surfaces and glue them together, um, we want to be able to take elements in their vector spaces and glue them together as well. Okay. And this needs to be vital linear. So this the glue of the union one should also be vital here. Um, and so I guess this is and yeah, so this is for um, I guess when the order characteristic this is less than or equal to negative two. Um, and so I forgot to mention a condition union, which sort of is, sorry, why I was confused a little bit about this, why it makes sense, but um, so we want this union to behave nicely with respect to this vacuum. So when we do the disjoint union on this side, this kind of is doing nothing if we disjoint union in the empty set. And so we want this to map. This such that the union one, and so then here, um, oh, that condition, and then um, down here, if we can cut out a pair of pants and actually get something that's not empty, then we want this. We want to have some sort of gluing. Map to do this. Okay, and so also just to note, if you were talking about these multi categories more specifically, you could kind of say that the disjoint union gives this board one structure of a multi category. Um, and over here, this is sort of using the Cartesian product, and the union axioms are kind of saying that. It should be a functor of multilinear categories, and then this excision is sort of more structured than that. Um, okay, so we have a free target theory. Um, so yeah, this is a free target theory. So it's this functor with two morphisms. And the union is no question in the union. Yeah, so that's kind of what I sort of, so that comp is compatible with associativity and commutivity of the Cartesian products and the unions. So, yeah, and then right up the details, but yeah, so exactly you want all of those things. Um, so, now we've got this, we can define the target theory. So, the type space, we didn't just have these vector spaces and these two 
morphisms, we also had these length functions. Um, and so here, a target theory is going to be pre-target theory with some idea of this length function. So, target theory is pre-target theory. B. Together with um, length functions. And so these length functions are going to map simple post curves to non negative real numbers for length functions together with. Um, and so this index here, this is the index um, associated to each of these vector spaces. So we're landing in an element of pro V, and so we have some index associated to the element, associated to this surface. And then the alpha A is indexing the family of semi norms. on this vector space. Okay? So we have length functions for each of those indices. Um, and these satisfy a bunch of properties that are going to sort of be analogous to some of the properties we're talking about. Type in the space. So, my functions um, such that we have a lower bound. And so all of these properties are sort of going to be used to prove the convergence of the sums that we want in this E. Um, so, for all things indexing this E sigma, um, there exists some functorial constant, so basically this constant is just depending on the topology of the surface. Um, so we have some constants um, for each i, such that the infimum of all of these lengths where we vary alpha and gamma, so we vary the semi-norm that we're taking in, so that we sort of have associated to the vector space, associated to this index. Ah, it's been a mouthful. Um, and we also vary the curves, so we consider all lengths on the surface, of curves on the surface. So we want this to be bound by our constant. So this was kind of analogous to this um, the way we, uh, this is, I guess, saying that the systole on these spaces was bounded. All right, so we had these elements of type more space, and we restricted to some subset of type more space where the systole was bounded, and this is sort of the analogous property, I guess, here. Um, and so in type more space, we also had bounds on. the number of uh, curves with uh, some sort of bound on their um, lengths. So again, for all the index, uh, for all i, there exists some constants, again, just depending on the topology of the surface. Um, so such that for all of these semi-norms, and all real numbers greater than zero. Um, this number of curves 
um, with a length bounded above by lambda is uh, polynomially or sort of yeah, polynomially grows in the lambda. So analogous to the Takamoto space example. So this this number of curves um, not homeomorphic to an element of the boundary. The lengths of these curves such that they're bounded above by this lambda is uh, or grows at most polynomially in lambda with respect to these two constants that we have. So here in the Tychomore space example, this d was related to the dimension of the Tychomore space. Um, and m was this constant. Just depending on the i, and we see here again, just depending on the i and the topology of the surface. Okay, so and lastly, for this target theory, we have a condition on the um, sort of number of small pair of pants. So this is kind of this picture I drew up before where we're saying Takamura or space, the lengths of the pair of pants most of the time relative to the first boundary look like flares or something. <laughs> if you want to keep the pairs of pants analogy going. Um, and so here we want to take that as one of our axioms. So this last one, so small pair of pants. So, again, for any, and so we can see here that we're constantly sort of using these vector spaces that are restrictions of the full vector space to actually do a lot of our computations, which is quite useful in proving the convergence. Um, okay, so for all of these restrictions of the vector space, we again get some functorial constants, so just depending on topology of the surface, here, this is where the surface coming in. <laughs> um, such that for all of the semi norms describing this, and for all possible connected components of the out boundary, um, we have something along the lines of this. So the number of pairs of pants. Bounding this out boundary um, such that we have these bounds on the length. So this is this first boundary. It's the incoming boundary. This is this out boundary that I've specified. So the number of pairs of pants where we have this inequality is bounded above by QI. Okay. And then there's an analogous one for when we have the empty set here, and the inequality looks something like and down to right, so these numbers are both bounded above by this constant. Um, so here, um, in the proof, at some point we're going to get, basically every time we have one of these cases, we're going to get the number one, and then we're going to sum over how many of these terms are giving us one, and so in the proof, we basically want this to be finite, because otherwise we're just going to get an infinite number of ones, and it's not going to converge. And so here, yeah, again, most of the time, um, we get pairs of pants that look like this. Or like this. And then finitely many often we don't have this picture, is kind of the idea. Okay. So this is gamma. Gamma? Sorry, so gamma um, this was did I not specify it? So this oh yeah, okay, so gamma here is the um, other curve in the pair of pants. 
So here the picture, this is gamma, this is B, this is B1, B1, gamma 1. Sorry, I should have said. Okay, so this, so pre-target theory with these length functions satisfying these conditions is a target theory. And now we can define initial data. And so you should kind of notice that these length functions, um, where are they written? Did I drop it off already? Oh yeah, so these length functions, with these three axioms, they haven't really interacted with the pre-target theory much yet. The only sort of interaction is that they are given by the same indexing sets that come from the pre-target theory. So really, for um, the full kind of picture that makes sense for then this geometric recursion, we need some initial data, and this in this initial data is where these length functions will sort of play, um, will interact, I guess, with the pre-target theory in a more direct way. Um, so, okay, so initial data for a target theory and so here I'm suppressing a lot of information just by writing the functor but so remember this is a functor with these morphisms and these length functions so, initial data for a target theory um, are functorial assignments. So basically this is saying if I take morphisms between the representatives of this pair of pants and tori's I'm going to write down, but I get morphisms between that send, or the morphisms that will be induced send the quantities I want to the quantities I want. So I want to start with two functions, or two starting up functions, two elements of the vector space associated to the pair of pants um, that are invariant under the mapping class group. Um, the P pair of pants. Um, and so yeah, again the functorial thing is if I had a P dash here, then the morphism induced between these two vector spaces, EP and EP dash, would send AP to AP dash, so functorial means here. Um, so I want these elements that are invariant under mapping class group. For each um, boundary, um, I want the so outgoing boundary um, of the pair of pans, so I had two of these. I want an element of the pair of pants associated to that. And so here, this C is kind of, in our gluing process, is going to represent when we have something like this, where there's some surfaces glued to both things, and B is going to represent this kind of thing, where we just had something glued to one um, boundary. Um, so a function there, and also, I want a function, oh sorry, a vector in a vector space associated to one whole torus. It's also invariant under the mapping class group. So here, one whole torus. And again, it should be functorial. So if I have a different one whole torus, these are the same Ds in the natural maps. So this sort of taking this wanting this to be functorial basically means that I can take any representatives of the pair of pants and torus that I want and then if I construct these on those reference things then I can get it on any other surface by just mapping it under the associated morphisms I get and that sort of gives me the construction on any pair of pants or any torus. Okay, so this is some initial data We'll see why in a second. Um, and what's where this 
interaction with the length functions comes in is when we have so-called admissible data. So I might be able to, might be able to even have all the axioms. All the boards at once. It's exciting. Okay, so okay, so uh, initial data. Just take the notation for the initial data from over there. Um, if the A and D are bounded, so this is an element of the bounded things here, and same with D. Um, and uh, we want B and C, so they're going to take care of the gluing. We want them to sort of have uh, their sort of norms bounded some way related to these length functions. So I'll call this B, C, D, K. So here we've got some sort of bound on these that come from these spaces, and here we're going to bound B and C somehow related to these lengths. So, this is kind of a bit of a mouthful, so let's do it. So, for an element of board one, and three, some error cans so that we can cut out. And some element of this index instead. Indexing the vector spaces on each of those things. Um, so here I'm breaking up, I'm going to effectively be breaking up B and C. Um, I'm going to be breaking up, I want to glue in B and C using this gluing, these gluing functions that I have, and I'm breaking up the norms of these gluing functions onto each of these semi norms. Um, okay, so, so for anything like this, such that k is less than this index, where this function is coming from the, this is the order preserving function from this morphism. Um, okay, and so there exists such that for this, there exists some, again, contorial number SK that's greater than DK, where now this is where we're sort of interacting with the length functions. So this DK is the same as the polynomial growth of DK. So where was the polynomial growth? Here, so this, we have some S, K, that's greater than this D here, that's bounding the number of elements less than a given length, or bounding the number of curves less than a given length with respect to um, this length function. Some number greater than that, and some constant, just depending on M, K, and J. Okay, so, you can get them all on one board, on the board, that's right. Okay,
Okay. Just missing the formula. Write it out by memory, hopefully. Okay. Such that. So there might be some spaces that I think I should not remember. So hopefully I can remember. So such that this, the norm of this. Um, glued element where we take this B representing a pair of hands and we glue it to some vector where V is um, an element of Some vector space like this. And so here we're taking, for example, a pair of pants, and then this is sigma minus a pair of pants. Okay? And so for some vector in that vector space, and taking B, and if we glue them together, then this bound in this seminal is given by this is with K, sorry. Um, this is down by this constant that we have, and the norm of V in J, where J was associated with this sigma minus P, uh, and then we had what is it, some. So we have these length functions. Fun? It's K alpha. K alpha. Oh, K alpha. And there's an analogous one for the C gluing as well, where instead of taking this, we basically, because this is now going to be an internal kind of boundary that we're glued together, this would have the same sign as this, if we do it for the C case. Um, but here, exactly these inequalities, or sorry, this sort of equaling zero, or if you sort of made an inequality out of this, being greater than or less than zero, this is the same inequalities that we're getting for these small pair of pants axioms in the B and C case. So up there, I wrote again this B case. Um, and the length functions are coming explicitly on bounding this gluing. And we see that this SK being greater than the DK, which was here, this is going to mean that if we sum up in an appropriate way, we're basically going to get some number that's increasing to the power of minus SK plus DK, and then that's going to go to zero, which is sort of going to be important in this proof. Okay, so now I've seen everything, and so we're almost done. Um, oh, yes, sorry, thank you, yeah. And so here, yeah, this is this bracket. So yeah, I don't know where my other page went, but it made sense. So, um, but yeah, so here we can see that if this inequality isn't satisfied, we're going to be getting exactly 1 plus 0, and so then this is going to be 1 to blah blah blah, and so this is where this sort of polynomial growth axioms come in. The times that we get 0, or we get 1, 
times whatever that stuff is on the left happens finitely many times, and so when we sum this, we get um, just a finite number coming out. Then plus this other term, and we kind of I sort of wave my hands and said should go to zero. Uh, what are these sums I'm talking about? So the definition of geometric recursion, and then we'll be done, and we can. Danilo will show us next time a proof that it's well defined. Okay, so. Okay, so for a target theory. So this is this E with these two disjoint union and global morphisms and all these length functions. Um, and admissible data, admissible initial data. So A, B, C, D. Um, we define and we can define well geometric recursion is by definition an assignment for every surface some element of the vector space associated to that surface given by the target theory um, defined as follows. So we want that this omega of the empty set to be one as an element of the, the base field. We want the pair of pants to be associated to so sorry, so this Oh yeah, no, that's fine. So we want this pair of pants to just be equal to this AP. Um, from the initial data for the torus, we take the DT. And note that these are elements of these are elements that are varying under the uh, representation of the mapping class group. And then we also say for disjoint unions, we just take um, the disjoint union function applied to each of them. So, sigma disjoint union, we want this to be, okay, so given some disjoint union of things, we can construct the um, associated omega. And so now we want to inductively define uh, the omega on the Euler characteristic. So then the last stage, we use all of this, well, we're not going to sort of use all of this, but we're going to use this C and B to, and the gluing to define um, what we want for a higher Euler characteristic or lower Euler characteristic. So for sigma connected, um, we take Right, so omega of sigma is going to be defined to be, or we claim is equal to, let's define it. Um, so we sum over the outgoing boundaries of this sigma, and then for each choice there, we sum over all possible pairs of pants, of homotopy classes of pairs of pants. That bound that boundary, and we glue that pair of pants by B in this case um, to the omega we get when we cut out that pair of pants. Okay, so B. 
this is really gross, sorry. And by here, plus. And then we have the other case. So then we sum over the pairs of pants that bound the, these outgoing boundaries are internal, so there's no, doesn't intersect another boundary of this sigma. We sum over these, and with these we glue in C. Okay, and so here, if we have all connected components of a certain Euler characteristic defined, then we base, basically can inductively then build up the elements of the next Euler characteristic, or the lower Euler characteristic, by using this sum. And so in this way, we've constructed it and it will be well defined. Um, and so, this is an element. So here, as well, these, um, these elements, in the proof, it should be clear if it's well defined that it's invariant under the mapping class group. But basically, the fact that all of these things were taken functorially, like the gluing, and if we know that previously these ones are a lot of the higher weather characteristic um, were constructed functorially, then applying some either automorphism of sigma to itself or uh, identifying it with another sigma. Um, this construction should go through and it should be functorial, and then basically we should end up with an equality like F, um, E of F, applied to omega to sigma for some F mapping sigma sigma dash to equal omega of sigma dash. And so then if omega of sigma dash is just the same thing, then we get for any element of the mapping class group, this omega is fixed by that element. And basically the proof should be clear from the functoriality of these and the fact that if we apply a mapping class group element, we're just going to commute these sums. So this should be clear if these are all convergent, which using this big list of axioms, um, we should see. So this is like two pages in the paper, so it's not very long. So Danilo will go through it next time and we'll see this sort of explicitly, all of these axioms realized in more detail for the type formula space. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker.